So I hope you can see my screen already. Um, that it's visible. Let me just confirm. Yes, yes. Okay, fine. Yeah, uh, so the, the, my topic for today is uh, patient blood management. And since this is a hematology congress, I thought that uh, we should focus maybe today about on the restrictive transfusion of the yellow blood products, which is uh, plasma and platelets, and not only in the peroptive setting, but I think also uh, we should think about the same approach of patient blood management uh, in oncology. And uh, you heard already about my background and uh, my uh, conflict of interest. So main conflict of interest that since 2012, I'm the medical director of uh, Temu Innovations, the Rotem company, which belongs uh, to the Werfen Group. So starting with the global definition of uh, patient blood management and uh, the latest definition from, from this year is that a patient blood management is a patient-centered, systematic, evidence-based approach to improve patient's outcome by managing and preserving a patient's own blood while promoting patient safety and empowerment. And you see, even the word blood transfusion is not mentioned. That doesn't mean that we don't need it, but it's most important to keep the patient's own blood in his body or her body. And uh, also what are the potential alternatives to transfusion? Um, so patient blood management involves the timely multidisciplinary application of evidence-based medical and surgical concepts. And of course, uh, the first pillar is about diagnosing an appropriate treatment of anemia. The second, and that's uh, where I worked in my clinical practice uh, most of the time, because I was responsible for big procedures like uh, uh, severe trauma, cardiac surgery, liver transplantation. It's also about detecting and managing coagulopathic bleeding. And this has always to be done in close collaboration, of course, uh, with our surgeons. And pillar three uh, is about appropriate treatment, uh, tolerance to anemia, but I think we should also extend it to a restrictive use of uh, yellow blood products, which of course uh, most of you already do uh, with hematology diseases. So uh, this is also a paper just published some weeks ago about patient blood management as the new standard of care to optimize blood health. And he see again that improvement of a patient's outcome is the center of everything. Uh, and one part is of course, optimizing coagulation. And uh, here we have to consider that on the one hand, uh, plasma or plate transfusion can be associated with a adverse reaction. I'm here not talking anymore about virus transmission and more talking about non-infectious adverse events like transfusion-related acute lung injury, transfusion-associated so-called overload, and transfusion-related immunomodulation. And this also applies, of course, uh, for our pediatric population, where Susan Gobi is mainly managing pediatric uh, at anesthesia at Harvard University. So again, uh, here in this talk, we will focus on non-infectious blood transfusion reactions like taco, trali, and trim. The problem is we cannot really test blood products for that, like for virus transmission. However, these diseases or these adverse events are responsible for two-thirds of all transfusion-associated mortality. And uh, this has been shown in several studies. This is just a publication from cardiovascular surgery, where we see that all the blood products, whether it's red blood cells, plasma, or platelets, are associated with a dose-dependent increase in mortality. So that means if we just have to transfuse less than five units of red blood cells, uh, mortality in cardiac surgery is about four to five percent. But if it's increased to more than five units, you see it went up to about 24 percent. And for plasma, it gets even higher to nearly 28 percent. 
So why are we transusing plasma in cardiovascular surgery? And that's maybe a good question, because when we look at randomized trials using plasma in cardiovascular surgery, or even the Cochrane meta ally published in 2015, based on 15 randomized trials, it's a little bit disappointing because transfusion with fresh frozen plasma was inferior to control, which was no transfusion of plasma for preventing patients receiving any red blood cell transfusion. And the odds ratio for red blood cell transfusion was even 2.57. So it's more than doubled if platelet transfusion was done. And this can only be explained because uh, plasma transfusion is not very effective to treat a coagulopathy, but it's very effective to dilute the hemoglobin level. Uh, since plasma is usually uh, a huge volume intervention because we need for that it's effective in any way, 10 to 15 milliliters per kilogram body weight. So the effectiveness is not really high. When we move even to patients with chronic liver disease, so for example, here in patients with acute variceal hemorrhage, a recently published multicenter trial showed that in this setting, even fresh frozen plasma was associated with an increased odds of mortality at 42 days with an odds ratio of 9.4. So that means nearly tenfold increase in mortality. And at the same time, there was a failure to control bleeding at five days with an odds ratio of nearly four and a prolonged length of stay at the ICU. So the explanation here is that in particular in patients with cirrhosis, the best driver uh, of bleeding is portal hypertension. And again, giving plasma transfusion, of course, increases portal hypertension, and therefore it's independently associated with poor clinical outcomes. And that brings us back to the group from Susan Gobi from Boston, where she published already two years ago in a review paper, uh, again, that we should not only focus in patient blood management on the reduction of red blood cell transfusion, uh, even for the yellow blood probe, that's plasma and platelets, most of the time, they are transused without a well-defined clinical indication. It's more based on gut feeling or that we want to correct numbers. However, the correction of numbers seems not to be a good idea uh, because that is associated with significant serious uh, adverse events. So therefore, Susan Gobi promotes the more goal-directed use of these products. That means we should only give the right product at the right time to the right patient and for the right indication and limiting unnecessary exposure, which finally results in an improvement in safety and outcomes by implementing a patient blood management approach. Let's move to platelets because thrombocytopenia is of course something which is uh, an important issue in cardiovascular surgery, liver transplantation, trauma, but also in all the critical ill patients at our ICU. And the question is, what is the impact of platelet transfusion in these patients on patients' outcome? We know there is a close interaction between platelets and fibrin for building up a clot uh, latest when we discuss the cell-based model of hemostasis. So going to our patients and discussing preoperative platelet transfusion in patients with thrombocytopenia undergoing non-cardiac surgery. So in this study, they included patients with a platelet count below 100,000 and 8.3% of these patients received a platelet transfusion preoperatively. However, this was not associated, again, with a decrease in red blood cell transfusion. It was the opposite, again, because it's increased from 49 to 66%. And in addition, there was a higher rate of ICU admission and a longer hospital length of stay. So what's about our pediatric population? And there's also a quite big study in more than 800 patients, 7.1% received at least a platelet transfusion while on the pediatric ICU. 
most often indication was plated count below 50,000, in particular in patients less than 12 months. So uh, what was the outcome in this patient population? Again, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome increased with an odds ratio of 2.5 and mortality increased with an odds ratio of 10. So again, a more restrictive approach seems to have the chance to avoid uh, complications and to improve outcomes. So if we go into specific settings, and that was uh, yeah, my place to work for over eight years uh, to deal with patients who have to undergo liver transplantation. And this is a study already published 13 years ago from Groning in the Netherlands because they could show that the intraoperative transfusion of platelets during liver transplantation was associated, again, with a significant increase in acute lung injury and mortality. And this was independent whether these patients get more or less than six units of red blood cells, it was just the, the fact that they get to, uh, platelets transfused during liver transplantation. And again, it was also independent whether before platelet transfusion, the platelet count was higher or lower than 50,000. So anyway, uh, platelet transfusion was associated with a significantly decrease in one year survival from 92 to 74%. And the same could be shown just four years ago by another group from China, also looking at the effect of platelet transfusion here on 90-day cumulative survival. And again, it dropped from 94 to 79%. So every unit of platelets transfused was associated with a hazard ratio of three uh, for 90-day uh, mortality. So is that only in patients with liver transplantation? So looking at a study published five years ago uh, and looking at the effect of platelet transfusion in patients with GI bleeding, taking antiplatelet agents, uh, univariate analyzes showed a significantly increase in major cardiovascular events uh, from 13 to 23% and in mortality from 1 to 7%. Uh, and also uh, hospitals stay longer than four days from 33 to 47% in the patient population with platelet transfusion. And still multivariate analyses showed an increased risk of death with an odds ratio of 5.6. And even recurrence of bleeding was higher in the group of patients re received platelets by about 50%. So they also came to the conclusion that we should be more restrictive with platelet transfusion in GI bleeding due to the higher in higher mortality. So you might say, okay, that's just cohort studies and maybe they were more severely ill and therefore they get platelet transfused. So it's not the platelet transfusion, maybe it's just the severity of disease. So therefore now looking at patients with uh, undergoing uh, randomized trials. And uh, this is a patch trial, uh, which looked at platelet transfusion versus standard of care after acute stroke due to spontaneous cerebral hemorrhage associated with antiplatelet therapy. And again, the odds for death or dependency at three months were higher in the platelet transfusion group with an adjusted common odds ratio of two. So the interpretation also for this study, which was published in Lancet, not a bad journal, uh, was that platelet transfusion seems inferior to standard of care for people taking antiplatelet therapy before intercerebral hemorrhage. And platelet transfusion cannot be recommended for this indication in clinical practice anymore. Looking again at the neonatal ICU, uh, we're looking at uh, this study published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2019, um, where they compared whether preterm infants with severe thrombocytopenia receive platelet transfusion as a more liberal threshold of 50,000 per microliter or with a restrictive threshold of 25 uh, per microliter. And again, the liberal platelet transfusion were associated with more mortality with an odds ratio of 1.57. 
So in the editorial to this uh, important publication, then it was mentioned that it is now clear that plated transfusion may have deleterious effects in preterm neonates, as shown for adults. And the evidence from this trial strongly suggests that less is more when it comes to the management of neonatal thrombocytopenia. However, the question is, what should we do when we cannot just rely on platelet count for the indication whether we should transfuse platelets or not? So recent evidence is more and more showing that adding a functional testing like thromboelastometry to platelet count might be able to improve the diagnostic performance to predict bleeding in patients with severe thrombocytopenia. So here we are looking at a study already published in 2014 in patients with immune thrombocytopenia. Uh, they included more than 130 patients with plated count less than 30,000. And what we see is here in these three examples, the plated count was very low between 13 and 15,000. However, dependent on the amplitude 10 minutes after clotting time in the XTEM assay, they could differentiate bleeders from non-bleeders quite good. And what we see is if the uh, XTEM A10 value was higher than 35, acute bleeding score was zero, where when the XTEM A10 uh, uh, value was below 25, acute bleeding score was eight. Of course, there's a gray zone in between, between 25 and 35. And this means that maybe we should look even more into details of a plated functionality or a compensation by higher fibrinogen levels. So when we look in at patients with the hematological malignancies, it's also done from the same group. Uh, again, they could show in this Athena study that besides plated count, uh, the XTEM clot firms, here they use the maximum clot firms, as well as the maximum lysis, added uh, important information and improved the prediction of bleeding in this patient population with severe thrombocytopenia. And uh, the same was also shown uh, from a group from uh, pediatric ICUs and neonatal ICUs in Athens in Greece, uh, where also the XTEM amplitude 10 minutes after clotting time demonstrated the best prognostic performance with a rock curve area under the curve of 0.85 with the optimum cutoff value of 37. That's reproduced what the other studies showed. That's uh, something around 35, 36, 37, with a sensitivity of 91% and a specificity of 76% for the prediction of bleeding events in thrombocytopenic neonates. So what this group did was then developing a new bleeding uh, prediction score where they combined the use of uh, rotem parameters like uh, here, XTEM A10, and lysis index 60, of course, with classically parameters like platelet count and creatinine level, because we also know that uh, a renal dysfunction can have a significant impact uh, on bleeding. And with this combination, they developed a neonatal bleeding risk score with an excellent performance to predict bleeding in patients' uh, neonates um, with thrombocytopenia, again, with a rock area under the curve of higher than 0.9. So after performing this development study, they also did a validation study in a new patient population with, again, 134 neonates with thrombocytopenia. And also then in the validation study, they confirmed uh, a very good uh, rock area under the curve here with 0.938 to predict any bleeding and 0.952 to predict severe bleeding. So this might be helpful in the future to better characterize which patients will really benefit from a plated transfusion because we know that a liberal way to transfuse platelets in this patient population is associated with a lot of risks. So 
What I would propose now from my personal point of view is that we should extend the concept of patient blood management from parative management to oncology. And the third pillar should also include, well, the third pillar is about restrictive transfusion, and uh, the restrictive transfusion also of yellow blood products like plasma and platelets, which means we should not use this product to correct number in non-bleeding patients. So we do, should use them more restrictively. Of course, we are on a very small line between coagulopathic bleeding and transfusion-associated adverse events. However, I think when we are liberal, we do it more for the con confidence of, of the physician that we feel better. But when we look at the data, a more restrictive approach might be better for our patients. So looking now at the uh, effect of plated transfusion or alternatives and how we can also monitor these effects uh, beyond just looking at the plated count. So this is a study already from 2009. And what it showed is that, of course, with the plated transfusion, we see an increase in uh, plated count. Here it was uh, 12,000 per microliter. And at the same time, we could also see what's the effect on maximum clot firmness, which uh, here was associated with an increase of 9.5 millimeters. To my experience, usually it's associated to an increase of 8 to 10 millimeters per uh, pooled or effervescent plated concentrate. That's also reproduced here in patients with severely thrombocytopenic hematology patients. Uh, you see here plated count was 5,000. With plated transfusion, it just increased to 11,000. So that's not a very impressive increase. However, when we look at the effect on clot firmus, uh, this was quite good with even increase in 20 millimeters. So that means, yeah, just the increase in numbers doesn't tell us really what is a functional change in this patient. And here we see uh, just also, again, a hemato-oncology patient, but the patient showed a not really a good increase in platelet count uh, with a possible uh, refractory. But again, when we look at clot firmus increase, uh, this was much better. And even in this case, which didn't show any increase in numbers, we see a significant change in functionality. So that means uh, this, I think, can give us more information and maybe otherwise uh, we would even start to give more platelets even when this is from a functional point of view not needed. So what is about the application of thromboelastometry in patients with acute promulocytic leukemia? Uh, here again, uh, it could have been shown and it's just published in the beginning of this year uh, that again, uh, hemorrhage could be predicted by um, the clotting time in extem as well as the clot firmness in intem or extem. And also, this was predictive for hemorrhagic early death in this patient population. However, using thromboelastometry alone might not be perfect. So again, we should also look at, of course, at the plated count and D-dimers, because in particular also D-dimers was able to predict bleeding as well as hemorrhagic early death. And what we learned in the last three years about COVID was that the combination of Rotem results and standard coagulation tests is the best way in COVID to predict thrombosis, but in these patients with leukemia to predict hemorrhage or even hemorrhagic early death. So I think, again, the future is to develop combined scores uh, for the best combination of Rotem and com uh, conventional coagulation tests in identifying patients at risk for hemorrhagic early death. Here we see just the data also from this study that, of course, age is an important parameter. A plated count only predicted bleeding, but not um, uh, early death. D-dimer was predictive for both. And that was the same for extant clotting time and could be supported further by uh, amplitude after 10 minutes in intem and extem as a clot firmness results. And maybe also that we have to look in a bigger patient population, also lysis parameter might be helpful here.
So coming back just once for, to the perioperative setting, where we know that uh, elevated fibrinogen levels can compensate for thrombocytopenia in cardiac surgery and very important in liver transplantation. Because here we see that very often there's a rebalance that the low platelet count is a counterbalance by high fibrinogen and high from bilbin factor levels. But then we have to reach levels for fibrinogen which are higher than 240 milligrams per deciliter or 2.4 grams per liter. And uh, this is supported also by uh, several studies um, uh, here from uh, the group from Innsbruck that, for example, fibrinogen supplementation increased the clot firmness in the same way as platelet transfusion. So it depends on the risk benefit ratio in each individual patient where we might even try first to compensate a low platelet count by increasing the fibrinogen level or even decreasing the need of platelets by combining both. And here we see on this graph that at baseline, we have a significant reduced clot firmness. Uh, then after giving fibrinogen concentrate in two dosages, uh, we are come close to the reference range. And the same is uh, here for platelet transfusion. So again, we have the possibility to decide which way we should use, and in particular, in patients who are refractory to platelet transfusion, this might be an interesting alternative. Uh, also, when we come back to patients with hematological so malignancies, uh, yeah, I, can, uh, in the, in the yeah, 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 I, I will do. Um, just on the, on the last slides. Um, yeah, uh, also in hematologic malignancies, it has been shown that this concept is also working. Uh, it also works with cryoprecipitate if fibrinogen concentrate is not available. And even the guidelines changed in the last 10 years quite significantly because also it was more and more recognized that uh, prophylactic platelet transfusion, the evidence is very low, but the potential harm is quite uh, big. So, and that brings me yeah, to the last but one slide. Uh, maybe you know that the World Health Organization last year uh, sent out a policy brief about the urgent need to implement patient blood management. But again, it's not just about reduction in transfusion, it's about patient safety. And I think that's something which we always have to consider and less can be more uh, in this uh, setting. And thank you for your attention and open for questions.